Yeah, welcome everyone. Uh, yeah, hi everyone here from a windy and rainy and, and a bit sunny late afternoon in Birmingham in the middle of England. We've actually had a rainbow this afternoon, which has been lovely. If you haven't heard of Birmingham before, it's famous for being the city of a thousand trades. Ozzy Osbourne, I'm sure you've heard of Ozzy Osbourne, Jeff Lynn of ELO and Spaghetti Junction. And I used to live literally no more than 30 yards from one of the off ramps there. Uh, going a bit further back, Joseph Priestley, a member of the Lunar Society, um, in 1774, he invented oxygen. And where would we all be without that? Yeah, I know he didn't actually invent it, but saying he discovered oxygen is big, but perhaps a little less dramatic. Anyway, I'm Richard Morton and I'm Head of Accessibility at the Government Digital Service, or GDS. GDS is part of Cabinet Office, which is the centre, if you like, of the UK government. And we lead the digital transformation of UK government which means that we run the government's website, gov.uk, among many other things. My role is to ensure that government services, UK government services and information are as accessible to as many people as possible and to ensure that teams across government have the capability to achieve this. So I look after the uh, accessibility regulations monitoring team, a little bit more about that later. I oversee internal GDS accessibility compliance and capability and I provide support across central government and organizations through communities. So making the UK public sector more accessible. I'm here to talk about improving accessibility across the public sector in the UK. The public sector here includes central and local government, public transport, the National Health Service, or our beloved NHS as it's known, and education across schools, colleges, universities, there's many other aspects to it like museums, some charities. But first of all, just what, what is digital accessibility in this context? I just want to clarify, this isn't about accessibility generally, so it doesn't include things like building access or the physical environment generally, nor things like provision of support of assistive technology in the workplace and in education. So I'm focusing on digital accessibility. So give a bit of background, everything we create must be accessible to everyone, regardless of whether or not they have impairments in any of these areas. So vision, hearing, speech, motor or cognitive, or it could be a combination of them. So for example, this means we must make sure that you don't need to rely on sight alone to understand web pages or documents. The text and the information on a web page or in a document should be accessible to a screen reader which is a piece of software that's used to read out the text or structure of, page, of pages on a website for someone who's visually impaired or blind. Similarly, we shouldn't rely on things being, people being able to operate everything using a mouse, a trackpad or a touchscreen. If things aren't built to work for keyboard users, then it could, it, it could exclude people, including those who use things like voice recognition. To successfully complete a transaction, and by a transaction I mean anything from gathering information or completing a form, just getting things from the web, four things need to be in place. And if any of these isn't in place and doesn't work, then the transaction will fail. First of all, you need to be able to perceive or receive information through one or more of your senses of sight, hearing or touch. Touch is perhaps the less obvious one, which is, could be in the case of a re refreshable braille display, which allows a blind person to read lines of text using their fingers. Secondly, you need to be able to understand uh, that content. So content, instructions, navigation, labels, all these things need to be understood uh, to be able to process them. Complex language and jargon can be barriers to this. And of course, we strongly encourage use of plain English. Thirdly, you need to be able to operate things. You need to be able to do that, though, using the means available to you to complete any action needed, whether that's opening a web page, acting on a link, operating a button, uh, filling in a form control, or it could be operating controls in a media player. And remember, not everyone can use a mouse or a touchscreen or a trackpad. And then fourthly, it needs to be robust. Now, what do I mean by being robust? Well, it means it needs to work on the combination of operating system, browser and assistive technologies used, and of course, settings of these things as well. And not just the latest versions of browsers and assistive technologies. There's a wide variety of assistive technologies used, uh, but that doesn't mean everything has to be tested with every combination. That would just be impossible, really. Services need to be designed, designed to work for people in the ways they need, but not just online, but also including things like telephone and face-to-face. -face. 
and letters. But as I say, today I'm covering the digital side of things. It's also important to remember that impairments aren't always permanent. Sometimes people don't have use of one or more of their senses due to illness or injury, such as having an ear infection, a burst eardrum or a cold, which would be a temporary loss of hearing. And we must consider people who don't have full access to things through their senses because of the situation they're in. That could be like being in a noisy environment that prevents you from being able, being able to hear as clearly. For example, in a noisy open plan office, on a train or outside in the street. User needs should be considered and met whether an impairment or disability is permanent, temporary or situational. From the point of view of barriers to accessing things, it doesn't really make any difference whether it's temporary, permanent or situational. It needs to be removed, barriers need to be removed or best, best, uh, better still avoided in the first place. Accessibility is something that's embedded in the government design principles. I'll read these out. It says one, start with needs. Two, do less. Three, design with data. Four, do the hard work to make it simple. Five, iterate, then iterate again. Six, this is for everyone. Seven, understand context. Eight, be build digital services, not websites. Nine, be consistent, not uniform. And 10, make things open, it makes them better. All of these are relevant to digital accessibility, but the most important ones are probably number one, start with needs. And number six, this is for everyone. But what does the law say around this? Well, in the UK, laws are in place around accessibility and digital accessibility. The Equality Act 2010, as it says on the slide reads, we have a legal obligation to provide equal access to people with disabilities. And for Northern Ireland, this is covered by the uh, Disability Discrimination Act 1995. The Disability Discrimi Discrimination Act was actually incorporated within the Equality Act, except for in Northern Ireland, which is why we have these two different pieces of legislation. For those of us working in the public sector, there is also something called the Public Sector Equality Duty. In the Equality Act 2010, it says that public sector organisations must comply with the Public Sector Equality Duty. This means that the, those organisations like central local government, healthcare and education, must think about the needs of people who are disadvantaged or suffer inequality when they make decisions about how they provide their services and how they implement policies. There are some newer regulations though, and these are known as the Public Sector Bodies, Website and Mobile Applications Accessibility Regulations 2018. And I'll just refer to those as the accessibility regulations after this point. They mean that public, sec pu public sector organisations have a legal obligation to make their websites and mobile apps and documents accessible to people with disabilities. Organisations need to firstly meet the latest version of the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines or WCAG version 2.1 to level AA. They need to make sure their websites, apps and documents are perceivable, operable, understandable and robust in the sense that I explained a little earlier. And they need to publish an accessibility statement. This will make clear the level of accessibility across the site or app. And I'll talk a bit about a bit more about that in a short while. The UK regulations actually came from a European Union directive of 2016. And these have been enacted across all of the uh, member states of the Uni European Union, all of the then member states of the European Union. The directive says that public sector websites or apps will meet the requirements of the new regulations if they meet European Accessibility Standard EN301549. And that standard, the reference has a reference standard with it of WCAG 2.1 to level AA. The regulations aren't quite as new as some people in the UK might think. They came into force actually in September 2018. And as a result, they're not affected by Brexit. They're already in UK law by the time the UK left the European Union. And this was actually the first piece of legislation created by GDS. So what about timings? The regulations have actually been phased in rather than a, a big bang approach. There's some important dates around the regulations. So I'll go through these websites and documents published on or after 23rd of September 2018 needed to be compliant by, 20, by September 2019. 
existing websites and documents published before 23rd of September 2018 needed to be compliant by 23rd of September 2020. Now that those first two deadlines have passed, that's probably a slightly complicated way of just saying that all existing public web public sector websites need to be compliant now, and any new ones need to be compliant as soon as they're launched. Mobile native applications or apps as they're known have to be compliant by 23rd of June 2021, which is obviously just over three months away. We ran a public consultation, which is often what happens with government policy and re regulations and laws, and it was aimed at public sector organisations seeking views on a few things. Firstly, <coughs> excuse me, what was needed to do to comply with the new rules, how the rules should be monitored and enforced, and what should go into the draft regulations that would bring the directive into UK law. We tried to make the consultation more accessible or as accessible as we could by providing it in multiple formats. So we had a standard sort of survey form we sent out and published on the website, but we also had BSL, British Sign Language format, which is quite a long video uh, covering the whole of the, the survey. And we also had easy read formats uh, for the documents, which is text supplemented by supporting pictures to help understanding. We created an iterated guidance as well to help understand the regulations. So this built on and refers to existing guidance for accessibility of central government information and services, because this wasn't all new to us. We did a lot of work on accessibility before the new regulations came in. Specifics in the regulations guidance include who the regulations apply to, which is most public sector bodies, but organisations have to decide themselves if it applies to them or not. We don't have a central register of who is a government body uh, or a public sector body, for example. It uh, details the requirements of the regulations. It details the limited exemptions, which includes some charities, for example. If they aren't publicly funded or they are mostly financed or they aren't mostly financed by public funding or they don't provide services that are essential to the public or aimed at disabled people so they could be exempt also uh, schools have some reduced requirements for how they need to meet the regulations and uh, public sector broadcasters for example the bbc and channel 4 are exempt there's also a thing in the regulations called disproportionate burden and that, that says if an organisation does an analysis that shows that the benefits to disabled people of auditing and or fixing certain aspects are outweighed by the costs to the organisation compared to the resources available to it, they can claim what's called disproportionate burden. And that's, it, it sounds like a bit of a cop out, but what it does is it helps organisations prioritise what they are going to fix. It doesn't mean they don't have to fix things, it doesn't mean they have to make things accessible. New in the regulations are a thing called accessibility statements, and they're one of the key requirements, actually, of the new regulations. And the statement has to include certain things. First of all, how accessibility was evaluated. Secondly, the level of compliance. That can be full compliance, partial compliance, or non-compliance. There are technical uh, settings for those. It needs to identify known issues, um, not necessarily a great detail on every known issue, but for example, if there are problems with alternative text for images, then you need to say that there are these sort of problems on these groups of pages, that sort of thing. It also needs to identify how users can get accessible alternatives. So particularly in the case of documents, uh, it might be they need a, a, a version in braille or large print or an audio version or different, different formats. There needs to be also a feedback mechanism for users to uh, ask, for, ask for alternative formats and to uh, ask for information and to complain. And then finally, there needs to be a, a contact mechanism for the enforcement body. If they do complain to an organization and they're not happy with the response, they can then go direct to one of the enforcement bodies. And importantly, it must be regularly updated as and when changes are made. There's no point in having an out of date accessibility statement we advise reviewing, reviewing the statements at least once a year, but obviously more frequently if you have um, a website that changes more free, much more frequently than that or significantly changes. It's also the case that even if your website doesn't change much, it's, if it's static year to year, things do change that are outside your control. Things like either the browser versions people use or the assistive technologies people use. So it's still worth going back and checking things and reviewing. 
there's actually a sample statement on gov.uk that can be used as a template to help website owners write their own. Prior to the new regulations, we'd also created a guide to the web content accessibility guidelines. Um, this was originally for version 2.0 of the web content accessibility guidelines. We updated it when version 2.1 came out in 2018. And this was to help make the guidelines more, more understandable, easier to apply. Um, I think everyone recognizes that it's, it's a difficult, dense set of documentation to use for um, understanding and dealing with accessibility. So for non-accessibility specialists, it's, it's useful to have more simple explanations of the guidelines. We also started, started a communications campaign uh, back in 2019. And that's ongoing. Uh, that's around raising awareness of the regulations. Started with things like the um, consultations, but then went on to raising awareness of what the requirements were, the dates, those sort of things. And it's through events like this and social media. And also it links to, to our resources. So it links to the, the general documentation, but also the more specific stuff and explains the steps that organizations need to go through to achieve compliance. That's at accessibility.campaign.gov.uk. So question about what is what does monitoring mean? How do we monitor the regulations? Well, actually, GDS also has a role in making sure compliance with the regulations happens. We monitor public sector websites, documents, mobile apps, and even things like intranets for accessibility. And GDS has been chosen to do this because we are a leader in online accessibility. We're also responsible for enforcing the requirement to publish accessibility statements. So we take on that legal responsibility within our own organization. So what does monitoring mean in this context? Well, it's a massive job to undertake. We've identified tens of thousands of public sector websites and that keeps changing. Although many uh, are, are in well-known domain, domain names like .gov.uk for central and local government, .ac.uk, universities, .sch.uk for schools, or .nhs.uk. There are also many that don't fit this pattern, and it's not a requirement. We don't, as I guess, as I said, we don't have a central register. We don't have particular, particularly strong rules on what organisations can use, what domains for those sort of things. So it does change as things like campaign Microsoft, uh, microsites or new initiatives come and go. So in terms of monitoring, we have to sample a test of web, uh, we have to test a sample of websites based on the UK population size. So that's different for each European country based on their population sizes. And we enforce the requirement to publish accessibility statements. Complaints uh, can also trigger testing and they come through an organization called the Equalities Advisory Support Service, EASS. Accessibility statements need to include contact details for both the public organisation and the EASS, as I mentioned earlier, that complaints can come through them. Our findings are reported to the Minister for the Cabinet Office. They're going to be shared with enforcement bodies and they will be published online as well. So what about enforcement? Well, GDS is the reporting and monitoring body. Enforcement of the law, other than the accessibility statement, is carried out by two, two bodies the Equality and Human Rights Commission in Great Britain and the Equality Commission for Northern Ireland in Northern Ireland. So there's two different jurisdictions there, all part of the United Kingdom, but there's one slightly different organisation and set up in Northern Ireland. And what happens if organisations don't comply or they're found not to be compliant with regulations? Well, what this means is the enforcement bodies could use their existing legal powers under the Equality Act 2010, and the Disability Discrimination Act 1995, and they can launch investigations, they can issue unlawful act notices, or they can take court action ultimately against offending organisations. And what's next for the accessibility regulations? We're creating some guidance at the moment about and um, building a process for testing and reporting on native mobile app accessibility, and that's ready for the June 2021 deadline I mentioned earlier for native mobile apps. There aren't anywhere near as many mobile apps as websites and across central, central government, there are very few. Uh, that's 
possibly partly because GDS has always recommended avoiding native, native mobile applications. But we do know there are many across the National Health Service and local government and other parts of the public sector. We will also be changing the regulations to remove the final links with European Commission requirements, in particular the, the requirement to report back to them. That's obviously no longer re relevant now that we're not part of the European Union. But at this stage, these will be mostly technical changes to the regulations rather than any major changes. There aren't any further ch plan changes at this stage. I want to talk a bit about going beyond compliance though, because compliance is a great way of raising awareness of accessibility and setting a baseline. Uh, so for example, it should ensure that websites work if only using a keyboard, and it should ensure that non-text things like images have associated text so that severely sight impaired or blind users or sight impaired people can get the same information as everyone else. However, the baseline of the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines doesn't guarantee accessibility. I hope, I hope everyone's aware of that. You know, Even if this was extended, beyond level A and level AA to level AAA, which includes more detailed requirements, you can still have many accessibility and usability barriers on a website or in a document. GDS has always advocated going beyond compliance and treating compliance as just the minimum, if you like, that needs to be achieved. So we do have a, a thing called government accessibility requirements, which is for central government services those that are subject to the service standard and service assessments. And these have more demanding accessibility requirements. Central government has uh, relationships with local government, but there is, they are a separate entity, if you like. So it, it, this is referring now to central government. So within central government, digital services must meet level AA of the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, WCAG 2.1, as a minimum. That's exactly the same as the, the new regulations requirement, except it does go slightly beyond those to a degree because there aren't any exemptions in, um, in the government requirements for things like live video content, maps or older documents, or for example, things like intranets that haven't changed. Those are some of the exemptions that are in the new regulations, but they're not in the um, government uh, general requirements for government services. Government digital services must work on the most commonly used assistive technologies. That needs to include screen magnifiers, screen readers, and speech recognition, speech recognition tools. We've set up a recommended list, and it's quite a pragmatic list. Uh, it's based on usage, but it isn't possible to test all types of assistive technology, let alone all brands, versions, and combinations with browsers. So our list is based on surveys undertaken by GDS some years ago, but also more recently other organizations like WebAIM, uh, the WebAIM uh, screen reader survey, for example, is a very popular survey of the most commonly used assistive technologies and browsers used with them. Government digital service teams must also include digital, uh, digital disabled people in user research. I, for example, can demonstrate some assistive technologies and I can test with them, or I can use persona simulations, which I'll mention later, to see how things work or don't work. But what I can't do is anticipate how a particular user, whether they're disabled or not, will do things. I can't, I, I can't understand how someone who is blind uses the web. I can get some understanding, but that's why we have to have such a big focus on user research as part of user-centered design to make sure we're focusing the users here, users with disabilities, users with access needs, users of assistive technologies. We have a number of other resources, um, as well as the guidance for the regulations and the service manual guidance. We try and signpost other useful resources. There are many good resources available, including these posters from Home Office. These are just three of the posters showing do and don't examples of how to design for users who are deaf, deaf or hard of hearing, users of screen readers, and dyslexic users. So there's are three different posters. And there are, other, there are others available, several others available. Many of these things are actually already covered in the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, WCAG, but they are explained more easily in these posters. And they, they're much easier to understand and digest and put into practice. They're available at github.com forward slash UK home office forward slash posters. 
they've been translated into quite a few languages and almost everyone I talk, everyone I talk to about them has heard about them or has seen them up on an office wall. Although I suspect only true aficionado, aficionados might have them stuck up at their home office walls at the moment. I haven't gone that far. Um, I'm, I don't think I would. But I do wish I had a pound or a dollar for every time someone credited GDS with creating these posters. I do point out that these are the home office, not us, when people do that. Although people sort of see UK government as being one thing, uh, they are separate departments. But we do work closely with them. We also set up a testing lab to allow teams from GDS uh, internally to test using assistive technologies and other setups. We started very small and somewhat in an agile way with a couple of Windows laptops running JAWS, Zoom text and Dragon naturally speaking, which are the most commonly used screen reader, screen magnifier and voice recognition assistive technologies respectively. This later expanded to become an accessibility empathy lab. Uh, when we moved to a new office building in the East End, we had this space um, uh, available to us to create an, off uh, an accessibility empathy lab. So we expanded and we included different types of devices and technologies, uh, Android, Apple phones, uh, tablets, iPad, those sort of things, because they work in quite different ways. And other resources as well, such as visual impairment simulation glasses, and information posters from a, a range of organizations, not just in the public sector, but in the private and charity sectors as well. Uh, for example, we have things from Microsoft, uh, Barclays Bank, they've done a lot of good work in the accessibility, accessibility sphere. We've recently started um, running introductory sessions online. We did, you know, obviously we did these face-to-face -face for small groups, eight to 10 people but we stopped that last March and we, we started doing these online only. That's been working well, uh, it, it, although it is quite technically challenging to get things like uh, assistive technologies, particularly Zoom magnification working across uh, online tools. As part of the Accessibility Empathy Lab, we created uh, seven personas covering a range of needs and assistive technologies. And we run simulations of these on Chromebooks um, in the lab, also available to run by, Cre by teams in the Chrome browser generally or on Chromebooks, so they can run on any Chrome browser. These were based on user research, and we wanted enough different personas to cover a good range of needs, uh, but also not have so many that people would find difficult to use or choose from. So that's why we created seven. And this example is Ashley, who is severely sight impaired and uses a screen reader. Um, this it gives some background detail as well to help get some understanding. This, this uh, profile and the other profiles have been simulated on Chromebox through a profile that uses the built-in Chromebox screen reader, but it also significantly blurs the screen so that none of the text is readable. And we set them up so it would be easy to switch between the uh, personas on the Chromebooks. The only kind of strange limitation we found with that was that you can only have up to five different logins or profiles on a, a Chromebook at a time. So we had to sort of spread them across two, three different Chromebooks. These are freely available and open source at alphagov.github.io forward slash accessibility hyphen personas. We also set up a cross-government accessibility community Google group for questions and to share experiences and best practice. This was actually started before I joined GDS, which was just under five years ago. And when I joined, it was around 200 to 300 people um, five years ago. And it's now more than 1,300 across government and the wider public sector. This isn't just accessibility specialists. This is people across all different disciplines. So things like designers, developers, user researchers, product managers, content designers, delivery managers, a whole range. Um, and it's a really active community. There's been a lot of discussions on there. There's a lot of support goes on there. There's also a cross-government accessibility Slack channel, and there are separate Slack instances for local government as well. So there's a lot of good conversations go on there. And one of the ways that helps us is we're a very small cross-government team at GDS, accessibility team. We couldn't possibly answer all the questions that come in. Um, so, so it helps for people to ask these questions in the community and they'll get answers quite quickly. But also they get a much more diverse range of opinions and experiences um, 
across the whole of the UK and across so many different types of organization and teams. We do also have uh, an internal accessibility community at GDS and we're looking at the moment into um, accessibility champions type networks, uh, which are really popular and really good. And there's a, a cross government accessibility leaders network. That's a smaller group, a much smaller group um, designed to sort of talk more about the strategic things about how we deal with new regulations, new versions of WCAG, that sort of thing. And the, the, the sort of bigger topics that uh, to, to reduce the sort of um, traffic, if you like, within that community and how we deal with capability across government, how we deal with the what we call the digital data and technology profession and uh, keeping up professional standards. So I talk a bit about government communications, um, as well as information published on GovUK, gov.uk and government services. We've worked on improving the ways professional communicators in government works. There's a lot of communications goes on through public relations, through media, through um, social media. And obviously that needs to be accessible uh, as accessible as everything else. So working with the government communications service, which is also a part of cabinet office and other agencies within cabinet office, we've created some guidance around social media campaigns with some simple tips for making things accessible within the constraints of the social media tools, which are obviously improving all the time. It's now much easier to add alternative text to images and things, but we still know that a lot of people don't know they need to do this stuff or that they need to add um, captions to videos or video description to audio. Uh, as part of this, we also created a short online uh, on-demand training session covering the same aspects. And this work is continuing and there are clearly many organizations who need help and advice in this area when it comes to social media. And it's important because these, these messages need to reach as many people as possible. And it's become even more important, obviously, over the last year with the COVID situation that we make sure that this is as accessible as possible. So just going back to gov.uk, gov.uk was launched in 2012 and it helped lead the world in accessible government information and services. And uh, we will try and build on that legacy to continue to be not just world-class, but hopefully a world leader in accessibility and inclusion. And as a reminder, the, the reasons we do this work at GDS and across the cabinet office isn't just about meeting legal requirements or government standards. That's important, but it's just a baseline. It's just a minimum. It's about making things work and be available to everyone. We need to make these things work. So thanks everyone. Over to questions. Richard, that was so awesome. Uh, you know, I, that's really inspiring. I, I, um, I really love the fact that you guys have an empathy lab set up. I, I myself have found that to be an excellent resource for really learning and understanding. Building em empathy obviously is the, the foundation uh, of what we do as accessibility professionals, right? Um, so that's really cool to see. Thanks for the insight there. And, and also, uh, you know, I, I noticed that, uh, that one slide where you were showing uh, information about the community and how to get involved. So I'd like to, to really encourage members of the audience, do get involved. Uh, it looks like there's a, a great way to be an active member in the community. And what a wonderful day and age we live in where we can sit from the comfort of our own homes and, and make huge, huge impact. So definitely join in. Now, we have had a ton of questions. The, uh, the Q&A section has been lighting up uh, like a Christmas tree. So we are going to start out with one of the burning questions that's, that's being asked by a number of users, but I think this one sums it up the best. For testing and enforcement, is there an openly available resource you can use to discover all public sector websites currently in the UK? Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. There isn't, there isn't currently, we're working on uh, tools to help us discover, to, to crawl a web, if you like, in the UK, to crawl through domains. We've got registers of a number of things, but we, it is a complicated question. We will um, ultimately make that open source and make that available to anyone, but it's, it, we're still working on it is the answer to that question. 
Very cool. Yeah. And that's, that's great to know. There's a few questions along that lines of, um, you know, is the data available? Is there a way I can get information or access the, the results of that testing? Um, so it sounds like it's coming soon. Yeah, it is. In, in terms of the results of the testing, as I said, we will be publishing reports. We won't necessarily publish the, the detailed detail of that. We will be publishing the reports. There will be interactions, collaboration, communications with organizations. And obviously we won't publish all those, you know, emails and things like that. But in terms of the reports, we will be publishing those. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Uh, I got another question here for you. How often does the GDS update the personas? Yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's interesting. We haven't actually updated them significantly since we first created them, which was probably three, four years ago now. Um, I think we're always open to, to suggestions. They are open source, so you know they, people can contribute to those. We expect people to fork them and use them in their own ways. Um, I think we've we found there haven't been too many changes over time that, that mean we need to revisit those particularly, but I'm sure there will be, you know, things like virtual reality, things like artificial intelligence, things around privacy issues, GDPR, all these things are having an impact on how we look at accessibility. So yeah, it's definitely something we need to do. But yes, we haven't we haven't significantly changed them. Yeah. That makes sense. That makes sense. Uh, now, we've also had a few questions about uh, tools that you can use for automated uh, and manual testing. Can you give us some insight into what you, you know, what you use to make your job easier? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Interesting, we use Axe, uh, which is great. <laughs> uh, that's just coincidence, really. But we've used various tools in the past we've looked at. We're open to using different tools. We do... Um, what we call a, a range of tests. We do what's called a simplified test on um, several thousand websites. And that is um, done using automated tools as a basis with some manual checks. So things like keyboard testing, things like magnification testing, um, a few basic checks. So we do some simplified testing. When we do a full audit, uh, we, will, we will still use automated tools to help us with that, but it will be a manual process. So yeah, does that answer the question? Yeah, I think that's good. I mean, if you want to describe, um, you know, the specific assistive technology and browser stack combinations you use, that, that perhaps would be uh, helpful as well. I'd, I'd have to refer to the list, which I haven't got in front of me, but we, we sure. stick to the sort of the, the main uh, most popular tool, most popular tools people use like JAWS, um, VoiceOver on iOS, uh, Zoom Text, and Dragon Naturally Speaking. We're going to be using those most commonly used tools, but we we, we do constantly re review those to make sure that we're testing with the right range of tools. As I said, you know you can't test with every type of tool or every combination. Um, interesting. Also, we we try and use things like NVDA, non-visual desktop, desktop access, because JAWS is so good that it can hide some accessibility issues. It's, it's good at sort of papering over the cracks, if you like, which is fantastic for end users. It's not so great from a sort of understanding where issues might lie. But yeah, so we do that sort of thing as well. Yeah, that's my understanding as well. At, at DQ, uh, our testers use uh, variations, but uh, definitely seems like Chrome and NVDA are kind of like the baseline. That'll give you a broad range of coverage. Um, and then you can, you know, adjust to your, your audience, right? Use uh, analytics and, and figure out what is the majority of your audience using, and then you can adjust your, your tech stack to fit. Yeah. Um, all right, so I got another question here about uh, what social media channels or networks can we follow for updates on UK best practices, blogs, and case studies, etc. Um, there's one called GDS Team on Twitter where we publish our um, our own social media. You can follow me on at Accessible Web. Um, I'm not I'm not the fan of all knowledge, but I do publish stuff around that. And um, there is an accessibility blog, which is accessibility.blog.gov.uk. Uh, I think that's right. Um, there's, there's also a GDS general blog. So some things appear on the GDS general blog, but we have an accessibility blog, which um, does a lot of different things around the regulations, around technical stuff. 
but also around user experience. So we've got some uh, posts on there by other different departments uh, across government, local authorities, and by individuals who work in the civil service, for example, and their experiences of uh, working with you know assistive technologies using the internal systems and things like that. So those are sort of main places I'd say to, to go look, yeah. Excellent. All right, got another question here for you. If a US vendor providing a product to a public sector organization in the UK, uh, is a voluntary product accessibility template sufficient or would using the accessibility statement template be preferred? The voluntary product accessibility template VPAT is, is only useful for the organization procuring that product or service to understand uh, how accessible it is. They can use that as part of their accessibility statement, but the accessibility statement has to be in a particular format. It has to follow certain requirements, which doesn't quite match what's in a VPAT type template. So they can use it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but it can only be part of the accessibility statement. Very good. Um, how about this question from Dan? Have there been any instances of a public sector body being taken to court for non-compliance? I'm not aware of any yet around this, this these regulations. Um, no, so they, but that could be happening in the background, but uh, no, there, there haven't been any taken to court, no. All right. I got another one here from Sophie. Uh, do you use the WebAIM screen reader user survey to inform most popular browser AT combinations? Yeah, I think I mentioned that we used uh, a survey that we created back in 2016 originally uh, to find out what people used, which assistive technologies people used for government services. Um, for various reasons, we haven't rerun that survey since then. So since then, we have we have started using the WebAIM survey, um, which is a great resource, yeah. Very cool. Yeah, there's there's a lot of great resources out there, a lot of good data studies to pull from. So I'm, I'm sure a single source uh, is okay, but, you know, many sources is always better, right? Yeah. Um, all right, so how about, uh, do you have a user base who have, uh, do you have a user base who have to use these technologies day to day who assist with you, uh, who, who assist with this testing for you? So I, I think you kind of answered that in your presentation, but interested to hear more. Yeah, not specifically. I think that's important from the point of view of um, organizations and teams creating these services. From the point of view of testing, we're not specifically doing that. Um, the people in the team use the assistive technologies, but they don't use it on a daily basis. Um, but that isn't because we've said we won't do that. That's just the people we've got in the team currently. We, we'd happily take on someone in the team who used assistive technologies on a regular basis. We do, um, you know, internally, we, we, we sometimes ask people if they can help with testing. But we're very aware that, you know, people have day jobs to do. We can't keep calling on people to do stuff like this unless they're employed and paid to do it um, and it's always a problem with um, user research as well with user researching internal users if you like so users of internal systems uh, that's always a challenge and it's one of the questions I get asked so much is how can we get people to test this stuff and it, it, it is a challenge it is difficult because you know you shouldn't be expected to do this stuff one day a week just because you happen to use a screen reader or you happen to use zoom text it's a real difficult situation people have jobs to do yeah yeah absolutely absolutely yeah but i mean um you know if you have the opportunity to include a, a diverse uh, group of people to to perform testing i mean absolutely right that's that is a great way to to get testing uh but can you can you maybe speak a little bit about feedback from the audience right um you know, the, the folks who are using the application, how do you, how do you uh, gather uh, feedback from the actual users of the application? Which application do you mean? Well, if you have a website or web application, is there, is there a good way uh, or mechanism to, uh, you know, accept feedback from the end users? Well, in terms of the regulations, we, we've said the accessibility statement is one way. Obviously we recommend doing other things as well. We recommend 
people run surveys, things like that. But the main thing we focus on is user research as part of user centered design. That's, you know, it, it was that first um, <clears throat> design principle, user needs, user needs first, um, understanding what the users need. And that's above and beyond what the business needs or government needs. Um, there are government needs, but they need, it needs to be, what does the end user need? Um, you know, we're very focused on keeping things as simple as possible. That was the whole ethos behind gov.uk, not just in terms of language, but in terms of things like if you, um, you know, if you fill in a, a passport application, for example, you should only be asking the questions that people absolutely have to answer for that, for that passport application. You should be keeping it simple to, you know, one thing per page. We talk about a lot, you know, you don't put all the questions on one page. Split, spread it out to make it easier to understand and use. Um, so doing user research with end users, whether or not they have disabilities uh, across a wide range, we also recommend, you know, a range of ages, a uh, range of demographics is really important. Excellent. Well, Richard, I, I think that's all the questions. Um, Everyone, thank you so much for, for joining. Uh, we really hope you have a, uh, a wonderful time at the rest of AxCon. Uh, Richard, again, thank you so much for this talk. Uh, that was wonderful, great information. So with that, we will bid you all adieu. Uh, we are going to have this recording with translations um, uh, and the slides available for downloading. So. Please stand by and, and check it out when it's live on the site. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Josh, for moderating. And thanks, Kate, for interpreting. That's brilliant. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much to, uh, to Kate, for sure. All right. You all have a good one. Thank you.